Dude, you're getting a Dell. Okay, I promise that's the last reference to the Dell dude that I'm gonna make. But we have three Dell systems here. Got an XPS D300 here. Got an Optiplex GX110 here. And a Dimension XPS T500 there. These are all from the mid to late 90s or early 2000s. So let's find out what old Dell was up to back then and tear into these. All right, let's start with the XPS T500. This faceplate's in pretty good shape. I think for the most part it's just dirty. We've got a little bit of a deep scuff there, but it's not too bad. Got a DVD-ROM up there. Got an HP CD Writer Plus 8200 series there. The all-important zip drive. And got a faceplate molded floppy drive. Hopefully that drive's not too special. And if it is, hopefully it works. You can see we've lost the CPU and OS badges here. So I actually have no idea what kind of CPU is in this thing. I tend not to Google the model numbers of these systems because I just enjoy the mystery. But it should be no trouble to find replacement badges. Yeah, sometimes you just have to stop and appreciate the little things. Just look at the trouble that HP went to to make this little swish continuous throughout the drive. This is actually a raised portion that extends throughout. They didn't have to, but they did. And here's the back side of the machine. See, it's an ATX system. And despite the relatively barren I.O. shield here, we've got quite the assortment of peripheral cards here. And it even has the Dell ABCD diagnostic LEDs here. These can help you diagnose various different system ailments, just depending on the sequence of codes that get displayed here. And we have quite a bit going on with the peripheral cards. Got a TV tuner card here. This might have been somebody's media center PC. I'm not too sure what this one is all about. It's definitely an output for a DVD video. We've got the SPDIF jack here. Looks like line level audio output, S-video, and regular old composite. Now we got some kind of sound card and some kind of video card. And this is a pretty generic off-the-shelf case. It was used by a number of system manufacturers back in the day, including that Micron Millennia that I covered a few weeks ago. And a single thumb screw gets us in. And at that point, it's just a matter of wrestling these clips. Now that one actually came off pretty easily. Okay, that's not good. Got a RAM stick in there. Gotta wonder how much shock it took to get that thing loose. We also have a broken piece of something in here. This looks like it might have been part of the uh, case fan clips. And unfortunately, we are missing the hard drive. And that's disappointing because I wanted to see what kind of media center software this thing was running. I suppose that's gonna have to remain a mystery. But hey, at least we still have the CPU. It is a slot one motherboard. I'm gonna guess Pentium 3, but we'll see. This thing has had some kind of nastiness intrusion here. Got all kinds of splatter. I'll definitely have to give that motherboard a good wash. But let's go ahead and remove this air duct here. Yeah, not much holding that fan in place. Let's just get that out of there. That bearing is definitely gone. Oh yeah, slot one Pentium 3. Let's go ahead and get that out of there. Hopefully these clips don't break. Ah, oh, and it broke. Well, I should be able to fix it at least. Let's put that to the side. These things are definitely very brittle. But there's our CPU. Looks like 500 megahertz, 512K a cache, and 100 megahertz front side bus. That edge connector could definitely use some cleaning. Let's put that to the side. All right, let's see if I can get this crossbar out of here. Well, that was easy. All right, let's start with that video card. Looks like it's original to the system. Year marked as 1998. Not too sure what kind of card it is. Sure looks like an NVIDIA card. Possibly a Riva TNT or a TNT2. That AGP connector can definitely use some touching up. Let's put that to the side. All right, what have we got going on here? We've got the audio output from the TV tuner card going directly into the sound card input here. Let's get that out of there. And we've got the audio output of this DVD card going directly into the audio input of the tuner card. So let's get that out of there. And we've got our usual CD audio cable. It's connected to the DVD drive. Let's get that out of there. And we have yet another CD audio cable going to nothing. It would be quite a stretch for that thing to be going to the CD burner. I suppose it's possible, but I wonder what else this would have been connected to. Well, let's get it out of there. All right, let's check out that sound card. Got a Vortex 2, AU8830A2. Oh, it's a Turtle Beach card. Pretty clean little card. 
Let's put that to the side. All right, DVD card. Surrender your mysteries. C Cube Ziva PC. Oh, this is a DVD decoder card. Yeah, this would be used to offload your DVD decoding and keep the stress off the CPU. Pretty clean little card. Just dusty. The year marked as 1998. All right, let's check out that tuner card. And this is another STB Systems card, just like the video card. Makes me wonder if this was original to the system. It's interesting what they did here with this copper grid that's everywhere. I'm guessing that's for attenuation of interference. Very interesting. All right, let's get these drives disconnected. It's very interesting what they've done here with the cable that goes to the DVD-ROM and zip drive. They crimped the third 40-pin connector right in the middle there. Looks like they were trying to get these three drives on the same IDE channel. Well, obviously that wouldn't work. Looks like failing that, they made the CD burner the slave for the primary IDE channel. With this crazy long IDE cable. Look at the length of this thing. <laughs> and finally, got a comparatively tiny floppy cable. Ah, uh, this thing uses that weird proprietary Dell power supply connector. It looks like standard ATX, but it's not. That makes these power supplies really hard to test. That sure makes me nervous with all this splatter residue everywhere. Anyway, let's get it disconnected. I sure do love that no guesswork front panel connector though. All right, let's check out that RAM. Let's start with the stick that was flopping around in there. Got a 256 meg PC133 micron stick made in the UK. Doesn't look like it took any damage from its little excursion. Should be fine. Let's check out the next one. And we've got an identical stick. Always nice to have a matching set. All right, let's get this motherboard out of here. Looks like it's mounted in quite a strange way. There are no screws holding the actual motherboard to the case here. Looks like we just have this single screw at the back here. And once that's out, we should just slide towards the front. Yeah, it looks like it. Yeah, that was pretty easy. Yeah, this board has some kind of splatter everywhere on it. So it is definitely getting a bath. Before I do that though, let's get this CPU bracket out of here. Now let's get that little retention bracket off there. I'm very pleased to see that this motherboard has all Nichicon caps. All right, let's fix this bracket. Let's start by cleaning it up with some IPA. That way no dirt interferes with adhesion. Now I'll scuff up the outside with 120 grit sandpaper. That just gives something for the epoxy to bite to. I'll clean up any loose bits. Same deal for the bracket. Now I'll use this gel type super glue to temporarily hold everything together. I like using the gel because it's much easier to control. It doesn't run all over the place like regular super glue. Let's just wipe off that excess. Now I'll give that some time to cure. And now I'll just reinforce it with some JB Weld epoxy. And I'll just let that cure. There, that's cured up nicely. And the motherboard is washed and dried, so let's get that CPU bracket back on. All right, I got that fan cleaned up, but that is one of the worst fan bearings I have ever heard. So let's go ahead and fix it up. And you know the drill, cut into the label. And that gives us access to the bearing. Just gonna drop a three in one oil in there. Now I'll run it till it sounds happy. All right, well, it's better. Certainly not the quietest fan in the world on its own. It can definitely stand to be upgraded. Now I'll wipe up the excess with IPA and take that date code with it apparently and seal it up with Captain tape. Good enough for now. Okay, well after inspecting this power supply, I don't trust it as far as I could throw it. There's definitely some signs of water damage. And on top of that, it uses these proprietary Dell only power connectors. This is not a standard ATX connector. And after searching and searching, I cannot find a pinout for these. And on top of that, this power supply has this glue everywhere. And this glue is hygroscopic, so it absorbs moisture and becomes conductive. In fact, let me show you. Yeah, see we're reading about 32 mega ohms there. And that glue shouldn't conduct anything, obviously. See, even on this spot that looks okay, it's clearly not. So this power supply is no good. But hey, at least we know it ate okay. It's very important that your power supply has proper nutrition. However, all that being said, Let's see if this thing explodes. Oh well, it didn't explode. Boring. But luckily I have no shortage of these Dells, and a couple of them are in serious disrepair, so I went ahead and harvested the power supply out of one of them. And it's the same exact model. I also happen to know that this power supply is good. 
But let's go ahead and take it apart and clean it up anyway. And we're super dusty in here, but hey, at least the glue's not conductive. Let's just make sure that sketchy power supply is properly labeled. All right, let's go ahead and get that faceplate off. Luckily on these cases, that's pretty easy. You just have these three tabs. So I start at the bottom, just push that in, go to the middle, push that one in as well, and finally at the top. And it comes off just like that. Wow, they got really creative with the design of these button contactors and light pipes. Got the job done, I guess. Now with the removal of this single screw, we can actually pull this entire drive cage. We just push it forward, then slide it out the side, just like that. And floppy drive removal is also really simple. Just lift up on these two tabs and push it out the front. I'm really starting to fall in love with this case design. Starting to see why it was so popular. All right, got all the drives liberated from their cages and laid before us. And the DVD drive is a Toshiba Model SD-M1202, manufactured February 1999. And this is interesting. They give both the wavelength and power outputs for the laser diodes. And it has a Dell part number, so this must be the original OEM drive. And here's the top side of the CD burner, manufactured July 1999. And here's the zip drive, nothing surprising about it at all, though it does have a Dell part number. So there's a good chance that this is also an OEM drive. Let's go ahead and open it up and see how clean it is. Yeah, we're pretty dusty in here, especially around the ceiling ring that goes against the disc. Let's clean that up. Yes, yeah, super dirty. There's not much we can do about cleaning the heads in these drives. They are kind of sort of self-cleaning. When they retract back into the body, they brush against this piece of felt here. And that should wipe off any nasty debris. So I tend to just leave these alone because they're really fragile. They're almost as fragile as hard drive heads. So let's just leave them alone. And here's the floppy drive, Dell OEM of course. And it's a Sony drive, model MPF920-F. Let's open this thing up. Pretty dirty in here. Let's go ahead and sweep that out. And of course, let's clean up those heads. Yeesh, good thing I did. All right, let's go ahead and clean up that case. Looks like this bottom panel just slides off. Yep, sure does. Boy, is it dirty. All right, soapy water has gotten us this far. Let's try the magic eraser on this trouble spot. Magic indeed. All right, now it's the faceplate's turn. Let's get that perished sticker off of there. IPA is great for removing sticker residue. WD-40 works great too, but it tends to leave a film behind, and I usually have to clean it off with IPA anyway. But you do have to be careful with IPA, especially around badges like these. And once again, magic eraser on the trouble spots. All right, we're looking good now. Well, that CPU fan duct is made of the most brittle plastic known to man. It literally just crumbled in my hand while I was de-dusting it. I'm already behind this week, so I don't know if I'm going to have enough time to do a proper fiberglass repair. So I'm just going to have to glue it and JB weld it and hope for the best. Well, it's not pretty, but it should work. Also glued and reinforced these tabs on the fan, so we'll see how that goes. Pretty sure these two components are made from the same achy breaky ABS plastic. I have got to get a 3D printer. All right, let's get this thing put back together. Let's get a fresh battery in there. All right, let's see if all those plastic repairs worked out. Starting with the world's most brittle fan. Close enough. All right, how about the CPU bracket? All right, that worked. Let me just tweak that fin back out. And finally. And the only clip that I didn't reinforce did not make it. And the only solution I have to that right now is a zip tie. All right, now it's time to choose a hard drive for this thing. I believe this originally came with a 12 gigabyte drive. So this 13 gig Western Digital is close enough. And this thing has a very odd hard drive bracket. It just kind of hooks onto the drive through these two screw holes and then two screws hold it on. It's a simple design to say the least. And then it mounts upside down in the case, which certainly makes for an interesting IDE cable arrangement. All right, it's finally time to see what this thing does. Here comes power. Okay, it did a quick rev up and then shut down, so let's turn it on for real. And we are posting. All right, let's see if it boots to DOS. And yes, it does. Just gotta make a quick adjustment here. All right, so that floppy drive works, and both optical drives are detected. Let's see if they open. 
Oh, DVD drive stuck. Come on, you can do it. Maybe you can't. That CD burner is super dusty inside. I might have to get in there. Let's just do a quick clean up for right now. And let's see if it reads a disc. So it's not going well in there. And yeah, we failed. Okay, well let's try a regular CD. I don't see why it would make a difference with this being a CD burner and all. But let's see. Yep, no difference at all. That drive ain't right. Alright, DVD drive. You're my only hope. Let's give it some help. Come back. Yeah, there we go. Sounds terrible, but it's working. Interesting, it doesn't stay closed. <laughs> okay, well that's got problems. Maybe there's a problem with the switch that detects when the tray is closed. Yeah, that just ain't gonna work. Let's get these drives apart and see what's up with them. All right, let's start with the CD burner. Well, I guess warranty service is out. We make our own warranties around here. I think there's actually a screw under there, yep. We are void. Yeah, we got some dust build up in here. Let's just see what it's doing. Okay, well at least the head carriage moves. Let's get a disc in there. All right, spindle works. And it sounds like the head can't get a focus lock. Oh, oh, there it goes. Maybe. Nope. Never mind. It came close. All right. Let's try the simplest thing first and clean the laser lens. Let's see if that laser's even firing. And it is. All right, let's see if that got us anywhere. Doesn't look like it. Yeah, cleaning didn't help at all. All right, so I removed the laser lens shroud and it's actually really clean under there. Of course, it's possible that there's still dust deep down inside it. I'm just gonna try carefully blowing it out with some compressed air and see what that gets us. And no change. I'm not gonna say it's beyond hope. It does at least try to get a focus lock, but it is definitely beyond the amount of time that I have this week. So I'm just gonna have to put it on the shelf. Sit tight, old boy. We'll get back to you. Well, let's see if we have more luck with the DVD drive. All right, we got a random gear floating around in here. Got to figure out where that goes. All right, I'm going to guess this gear goes right here. And this looks like our open and close sensor switch. Maybe it's just a little dirty. Let's give it a little deoxit. Well, let's see where that gets us. Okay, well, at least stays closed now. Ew, those gears sound terrible. Okay, well, it's at least behaving itself now. Let's see if it spins up. Yep, looks like it. All right, well, at least we have one working optical drive. Okay, I added some white lithium grease and those gears do sound a little bit better. Still noisier than I would like, but good enough for now. All right, let's make sure it behaves itself while fully assembled. And we're good. All right, let's make sure it works. And it does. Okay, well I've had no luck finding a restore disk image for this computer, so I'm just gonna go ahead and install a retail copy of Windows 98. All right, let's get this thing installed. All right, we are getting there. Oh, we got the drum roll. And there we go. We are there. Now I have got a lot of drivers to locate. All right, I started with the zip drive driver. Already got it installed, so let's see if it works. All right, spun up, and it opened right up. Let's copy all this stuff over. And it copies. All right, that drive works. All right, let's start with the NVIDIA driver. Okay, so that driver didn't work, but I found the correct driver in the most unlikely place, Dell's official website. I can't believe they're still providing drivers for these old systems. Kudos to Dell. Well, let's see if I have as much luck with what is allegedly the sound driver. Well, not having much luck there. It said nope. Okay, well, this is the fourth audio driver I've tried, and it too doesn't work. 
I'm gonna have to give up here. I'm running out of time. Well, let's try the tuner card. And the TV tuner software won't run without an audio card. Okay, I guess that's not happening. Well, let's at least see if 3D Mark will run. Let's do the default. All right, that's running great. Yeah, that's running real good. Let's see high detail. I mean, it's not terrible. I'd say medium detail is doing pretty well. All right, I'll see what it does in high detail. Eh, could be better. Still not terrible. All right, let's see those CPU benchmarks. Eh, not too bad. It is running weirdly fast, though. All right, well, that's done. Let's shut this thing down. All right, let's get that faceplate back on. Well, I feel like this thing fought me every step of the way. Too bad. I'm forcing you out of retirement. It really would make a decent late 90s, early 2000s gaming machine, having AGP, PCI, and ISA. Just have to dig a little deeper to find some drivers for it. Let's move on to the next system. The next system is this Optiplex GX110. See, we have a pretty similar looking optical drive there. I'm gonna bet that's an OEM drive. Be interesting to see if that's an OEM zip drive. And we're badged as an Intel Pentium 3, designed for Windows 2000, NT4, and Windows 98. I see we have a screw stuck in that floppy drive. Let's try to get that out of there. Almost lost the game there. And we've got a Windows 98 COA sticker on the side here. This sticker on the top here suggests that this was a school computer. And here's the back side of the machine. See, this thing is not any kind of standard ATX. But we got pretty much everything we need on board, including an onboard NIC. And our lone peripheral card is some kind of sound card. And here's a good look at that label. Now, getting these cases open starts with sliding this release tab this way. Of course, it's pretty stuck. There we go. And then you push this release button on the front of the case here. And it opens up just like that. <laughs> this thing is so big, it's kind of hard to get it all in frame. But we do have a hard drive, so that's good. And here's a look at that very strange PCI riser setup. And it looks like this whole thing should just pull out. Let's see. Yeah, there we go. Let's get that audio cable disconnected. And that sound card is a Creative CT5803. And there's the back side of the card. And like any good enterprise grade Dell tower, this power supply just flips up out of the way. Just hit the release tab here. How convenient. All right, let's get it disconnected from everything. And we might as well clear out these cables. All right, let's check out that CPU. See if this thing's as brittle as the last one. Well, so far so good. Let's get that heat sink off. Well, that thermal pad's definitely seen better days. And as advertised, got an Intel Pentium 3, 667 megahertz, 256K of cache, and 133 megahertz front side bus. All good on the pins. Let's see if we can get that fan out of there without destroying it. That thing's nasty. So nasty. Let's see what we have for RAM. Got a 64 meg PC100 stick here. Looking pretty clean. Let's disconnect that front panel. I want to get this motherboard completely out of here. Looks like we have a single screw here. Now we should be able to slide towards the front. There we go. Ooh, there's something rattling around back there. Yeah, we had a wayward screw. Actually, a couple of them. I wonder where those came from. And surprisingly, that battery still has some charge left. But that's not enough charge for my liking. Let's go ahead and replace it. And nothing really left to do on this board except knock the dust off. 
using an anti-static brush, of course. All right, let's dismantle this riser because it's a mess. There, all clean now. All right, let's get that perished thermal pad off of there. And just clean these up. And this is just IPA on a toothbrush. There we go. Done and done. Fan cleaned up nicely. And the bearing sounds perfectly fine. All right, let's get some chill juice on that CPU. Now let's get the heatsink back on. And unfortunately, this power supply uses those same Delhi connectors. So I'm not gonna be able to do a proper test. I'm just gonna have to risk it. But luckily, this power supply uses this good quality Celastic and not that terrible hygroscopic glue. So I'm just gonna give this power supply a good de-dusting and hope for the best. All right, got that thing de-dusted. Let's just make sure it survives at idle. Here we go. Okay, that's long enough. It would have exploded by now. Okay, now let's figure out how to get this faceplate off. I'm guessing this button up here has something to do with it. Maybe. All right, that worked. We got another loose screw in there. That definitely doesn't look like it belongs to this system. Okay, well, drive removal looks pretty straightforward. Looks like we just squeeze these tabs together. Yeah, there we go. Surely the floppy drive is that simple. And yeah, sure is. That is quite the contraption that they have for this floppy eject button. <laughs> they just moved it off to the side. And that's the same model floppy drive as the previous system. Dusty, dusty. Luckily, it looks like it's all in the front. Heads are clean enough. Looks like that zip drive is OEM. Let's get that dust off. And not very dusty in here, but there sure is a lot of debris. Let's clean that out. I've just wet the Q-tip with IPA so it picks up better. And that'll be dry long before I put a disc in here. And the optical drive is a Samsung model SC148. Looks like it could be a 48 speed CD drive. Also looks like it's OEM. All right, now it's the hard drive's turn. Oh, that's interesting. This case design is really clever. And it's a 10 gigabyte MaxTor drive. The manufacture date of June 3rd, 2000. Got a Dell part number there. Just wipe that off. And it looks like I should be able to detach the base from this case too. Let's see. Yep, sure can. Oh, that is so nasty. And this is why we deep clean. Well, at least it cleaned up nicely. All right, now it's time to do the faceplate. All right, turned out great. I am gonna have to replace this Pentium 3 sticker though. Fortunately, I think Geek and Spiel sells replicas of these. All right, time to reassemble. I just have to show this hard drive cage again. I just love that. All right, power supply, I got faith in you. Don't blow up my computer. Here comes power. All right, that's normal. Well, let's start it up. Ooh, the hard drive initialized, and we're posting. Oh no, the cover was previously removed. <laughs> well, I guess I had a secondary hard drive at some point. Continue. And we are booting, hey, <laughs> Windows 98. Uh-oh, we had an improper shutdown at some point. That hard drive sounds lovely. <laughs> what is that? It's a very strange background. <laughs> okay, went straight to a screensaver. Get out of there. Set up my monitor. Oh, we got sound. That hard drive sounds like a drum solo in that cavernous case. Chicks gone wild. That's a strange thing to have on a school computer. That's gotta be just an unfortunately named program. Okay, some kind of game. Let's get out of there. <laughs> okay. All right, let's see what we got for hardware. Hey, it's got Intel graphics. Interesting. I wonder what that unknown device is. Ah, I don't care. I got video and sound, I'm happy. Let's see what else is on here. Seems like a bunch of edutainment games. Let's see if the school district paid for WinZip. <laughs> of course not. 
<laughs> Not surprised at all. I don't think anybody paid for WinZip. And that hard drive's just a little under a quarter full. Well, let's try the CD drive. Is that thing dead? Hmm. Yeah, that thing's dead. Interesting. Okay, well, how about the zip drive? Spun right up, and opened right up. Good old zip drives. Well, let's just see if this stuff copies over. I don't actually want this on here, but I just want to see if it copies. And it sure does. All right, how about the floppy drive? And that works too. Awesome. Well, since I got 3D Mark on here, might as well install it. Pretty good, pretty good on low detail. Not too bad on medium detail. Here's the real test. And it's a slideshow. And yeah, obviously the NVIDIA card did way better. But this is actually pretty impressive for onboard Intel graphics. Wow, it's actually not a slideshow on high detail. Well, not too much of a slideshow. Alright, let's see what that CPU's got. Honestly, it would be a lot better without all that stuff running in the background. That hard drive is just a thrashing away. And every time it does, you get that stutter. Alright, that's enough of that. Yeah, we got WinVNC on here. Guess now we know how the school IT was managing the system. Alright, let's drop down to DOS mode and run ScanDisk on this drive. Even though it sounds really healthy, you never know. I think we're gonna win. Yup, no bad sectors. Alright, let's shut this thing down. Well, I've got no life out of this drive, even on standalone power. Oh well, I've got plenty of drives. So I swapped in a known working Dell OEM DVD drive. At least it looks the part. You know, I have to admit I wasn't expecting much from this system. Now I actually kind of love it. This case is a dream to work on, and it has great hard drive acoustics. Those are two very important qualities for me. Just have to see if there's room in my life for it. This thing is big. Let's move on to the next system. Next system is this Dimension XPS D300. You'll notice the striking resemblance to the first system, and that's because they use the exact same case, just with a different faceplate design, as was the style at the time. But I'm curious to know exactly what the differences are. You can see we have a tape drive here. I want to say that's a Seagate Hornet. I believe it takes the Trevan or Trevan tapes, however you pronounce that, and I do not have any of those. So unfortunately we won't be able to test it, but we've got an OEM looking optical drive here, and we're badged as an Intel Pentium 2, designed for Windows 95. And having a look around the back, the differences start to become apparent. You can see we have onboard sound here, and the game port, and we have what looks like an asset tag, possibly from the company that owned this machine. We've got some kind of video card here, and the all important dial up modem of course, and conspicuously absent are those diagnostic LEDs. I guess that was a concept that came later. And of course, being the same case, it opens up in the exact same way as the first system, though with quite a bit more fight in it. There we go. All right, luckily we have a hard drive in this thing. Hopefully it works and I won't have to go on another driver hunt. And that video card has a daughter board on it. I wonder what that's all about. I'm gonna go ahead and start with that. Oh, it's a Matrox card. And it is incredibly dusty. Let's get that daughter board off of there and see what it is. With four rows of pins on each side, that thing's not easy to get off. There we go. Ah, this is a video RAM expansion board. Very nice. I want to say this is a four megabyte card, so this expansion board should bump it up to eight. And look at that, we got real OPL sound in this thing. Getting all kinds of lucky. And there's the legendary Intel Pentium 2. Let's try to get that out of there and see what kind of plastic breakage disasters it has in store. So first I have to remove this blue plastic support bar thing ever so carefully. Hey, it didn't break. I better not celebrate too soon though, because I still have these guys to contend with. All right, nothing broke. This thing has a giant heatsink. 
Looking pretty good on the edge connector. Year marked as 1996. Oh, can't forget our dial-up modem. That big old flash chip is interesting. The main chipset is made by Texas Instruments. And it is a US Robotics Sportster. Model 0484. Looks like a Dell OEM part. Okay, every time I encounter a max cell battery, it always somehow still has some charge. So let's see if that one does. And it does. It's a little bit low, but that should still be enough to keep the clock. I wonder what is up with max cell batteries and longevity. All right, let's get these drives disconnected. Man, that tape drive's got some fight in it. I'm gonna have to pull that hard drive out in order to disconnect power. So that's gonna have to wait till the faceplate comes off. And this too uses those weird Dell proprietary power connectors. So we may have to roll the dice on this system too. All right, let's see what we got for RAM. And no hints at all on this stick, at least not without Googling chip part numbers. Let's check out the other one. And no hints on this one either. Why, RAM manufacturers, why? All right, let's deface this thing. It comes off the same exact way as the first system. Now let's get those drives out of there. Well, that's definitely the longest of one of those types of screws I've ever seen. <laughs> all right, here's all of our cage-free, free-range drives. And they all appear to be OEM drives. And the Rust Spinner is an 8.4 gigabyte IBM drive, manufactured November 1997. And here's the logic board. It's quite interesting what they've done with the spindle motor. All the leads for the windings are just right there. It's not really anything protecting them. And the flexible Rust Spinner is an NEC drive. FD1231H, manufactured October 1997. And the stringy rust spinner is a Seagate drive. You know, it's not even clear to me which one of these strings is the model number. There's also a number on the back of the drive. And the CD-ROM is also an NEC drive, model CDR-1900A, manufactured November 1997. It's interesting to see just how many OEMs Dell had for drives. There's been quite a few of them just in this video. All right, let's start clean up with this tape drive, because it is a mess. Looks like I have to remove this logic board in order to get to most of the components. So let's get that off of there. Wow, these drives are really easy to service. All these connectors just line up with their respective flex cables. It's pretty clever. All right, let's at least clean up what I can see. All right, well that's as clean as that's getting for now. And this belt has plenty of traction. I can't even really get it to slip. There sure is a lot of leftover flux on that IDE connector. Look at that. And that is solid. That floppy drive is a proper mess too. All clean now. And once again, got another weird Delhi power supply. So I'm gonna have to rely on visual inspection and luck. Fortunately, it actually looks really clean in there with minimal dust buildup. I don't see any conductive glue. Well, let's see what power does to it. It's weird with every single one of these power supplies. As soon as I give them power, the lights in the shop flicker for just an instant. Okay, well, no trouble at idle. Maybe we'll get lucky this time too. This plastic is clean. All right, got that case fan cleaned up. And wouldn't you know it, not a single thing broke. It's interesting to see the decline in material quality compared to the first system. And that fan bearing is perfectly fine. All right, time to get it together. The time has come to do the thing. Here we go. Okay, the hard drive initialized. And we are posting. Counted up 192 megs of RAM. Hey, it's got NT4 on it. I had suspected workstation duty, with that tape drive being in there and all. All right, we're probably gonna have to crack the password. Yep, indeed we are. Well, let's see if the password happens to be blank. Nope. All right, I'm gonna have to see if I can get this thing to boot Nopix so we can get rid of that password. All right, well, I've had some incredibly rotten luck with optical drives from this set of systems. Let's see if good old NEC bucks the trend. It's just a little bit dusty in there. And let's see if it boots the latest version of Nopix. Okay, well it's spun up. All right, Nopix wants to boot. Okay, well the graphical environment's not doing too great. Fortunately, we don't need it. Let's break out to a terminal. Let's see what device node that hard drive got assigned. 
Wow, there's a lot of partitions on that thing. Now, with it being NT4, it could either be NTFS or FAT32. And I'm guessing since there's a bunch of 2GB partitions that it's FAT32. Let's see. And yep, all FAT file systems. Now I gotta figure out which one contains the Windows install. I'm guessing it's SDA1, since that would most likely be C drive. Let's see. Yep, there it is. Let's get into that SAM hive. Okay, where is the System32 folder? Is it not capitalized? Okay, that's weird. Maybe it's all caps? Aha, very strange. There's our SAM hive. We'll just run chntpw on that. Let's blank that password. Let's get out of here. Go ahead and write that out, and reboot. Okay, now... Aha! We are in! Oh no! Norton himself! Okay, apparently this thing belonged to a university. My virus definitions are out of date. Okay, stop dialing. I'll just snooze on that. Ooh, I better update my Norton Utilities. No, I would not. Norton System Doctor. Oh, I haven't seen that in forever. Why does this keep coming up? Can you go away? <laughs> this thing has AOL Instant Messenger on it. And it's never been used. Probably got more use on the actual user accounts. Oh my god, it has real player on it. Wow, real player. I better wait for that to buffer. Let's see what else is on here. Kid picks? No way! Oh, what's going on? Never knew kid picks to interfere with the video driver like that. Okay, I don't think kid picks is happening, though the hard drive is thrashing away. Well, that's disappointing. What else is on here? Looks like just a bunch of kids stuff. Oh, Reader Rabbit. Wow, I forgot about that. It's been so long. Netscape Communicator. Ah, it's been conquered by IE. <laughs> wow. How long has it been since I've seen this? All right, let's see what all those other partitions were about. They're all shared. Okay, this thing has some pretty sensitive data on it. Finance and accounting. I won't be rooting around in there. Guess this hard drive's getting wiped. It's on E drive. Okay, nothing too groundbreaking in there. How about F drive? Not very much. All right, let's try that floppy drive. And it works. Okay, now I want to do a surface scan of that hard drive. Problem is, with all those partitions on it, it's going to be really annoying to do that in scan disk. So, I'm back in Nopix, and we're going to scan it with the bad blocks command. Alright, we won! Let's shut this thing down. At last, a fully functional system. I was starting to lose hope there for a minute. But, of course, we still don't know if that tape drive works. But, that's not going to stop me from declaring this thing a tentative success. And I just love that little time capsule operating system. And even though I might rail against people disposing of computers with sensitive info on them, I sure do like when they come with their original software intact. Just gives us a glimpse of how people were using these computers. And I get to be reminded of all that lovely software I haven't seen in ages. Okay, I was finally able to find some spare time to dig into this power supply connector mystery. Apparently, if you remove the Dell proprietary power connector, and solder on a standard ATX power connector moved three pads down, you can use a regular old ATX power supply, and then I'm assuming this connector here becomes pointless. Now, I haven't verified or tested any of this, so proceed at your own risk if you try it. However, this should at least give me a method to test Dell power supplies in the future, because I'll be able to find the PS on signal. And as always, I'd like to give a huge thanks to everyone who subscribed and pledged their support on Patreon. Your support is definitely helping to keep me going. And if you're new to the channel, I hope I've earned your subscription. And if you choose to pledge your support on Patreon like these fine folks on the screen, it would help me tremendously because there's a lot more I want to do with this channel. But that's all for this video. Thanks for watching.